Hello. I've been reading some articles recently by nuclear rocket enthusiasts, and I thought it would be interesting to do a little talk about what it actually takes to build your own nuclear space tug. So this is the basic process we're going to talk about. I'm going to go through a number of items, and then at the end we'll finally have a space tug and we can see what it's going to do. So we're going to start by talking about safety. When embarking on any space vehicle project, please remember to take appropriate precautions. And specifically for this project, consult with your neighborhood nuclear engineer if you have any questions. Now the first step when we're building a nuclear rocket is to choose the reactor type. And there are a few different types. There's what's called a nuclear thermal solid core. There's a pulse nuclear thermal design. There are actually two different nuclear gas core designs, a closed cycle and an open cycle. And then in addition, there are a whole bunch of different variations and different ideas on how you might do this. Now for your first attempt, I highly recommend that you do the nuclear thermal solid core as it's by far the easiest and by far the most well understood. So if we're going to do nuclear thermal solid core, now we need to choose an engine design. And while there are a lot of different choices here, uh, some of these have been built, some of them haven't. But uh, for this one, I'm going to choose a design called Enhanced SNRE. And the reason I've chosen it is this is a uh, pretty popular choice amongst some of the nuclear rocket enthusiasts. And, <coughs> and it also comes with a manual. So there's this manual you can use. It will really help you a lot in the construction of this nuclear thermal rocket. So uh, let's talk about a little details. Uh, a few of the details about this specific design. Um, this is a, uses liquid hydrogen as a propellant, which is true of pretty much all of the uh, nuclear thermal rocket designs, with maybe a few exceptions. It has a thrust of about, about 112 kilonewtons, a specific impulse of 906, which looks very interesting and very promising. Uh, it weighs about 3,250 kilograms, and the reactor it's made of fuel rods that are 132 centimeters long, and the reactor core is about 30 centimeters across. So you can think of this as a kind of long and thin reactor. In that core, it will have 564 individual fuel elements. And it will use uranium, where the U-235 level is enriched to 93%. And overall, it's going to use about 65 kilograms of uranium in the core. Um, that's going to depend a little bit on the fuel rod density that you choose, and that you are going to need to figure out experimentally. Um, you need to make sure you have enough so that the core is sufficiently reactive to get the power level you want, but not so much that it's hard to control the power. And speaking of power, uh, this core is rated to put out about 550 megawatts of thermal energy. So uh, it's quite a bit of heat. So uh, the first step we're going to have to do is figure out how to obtain the uranium for this rocket. And this requires a discussion uh, about uranium and different kinds of uranium. Um, we're going to start by talking about natural uranium. And natural uranium is primarily composed of two isotopes. There is uranium-238, which makes up 99.3% of all the uranium atoms, and uranium-235, which makes up about 0.7% of uranium-235. And I have a little chart here. Um, we can see um, that it has 0.7% uranium-235, and that the cost for one kilogram is about $75, which kind of surprised me. It's actually relatively cheap 
um, as far as metals go. Unfortunately, this kind of uranium isn't very useful. Can't really do anything with it. The next step up is low enriched uranium. So we're taking the natural uranium and we are concentrating the uranium-235 atoms. And this is the kind of uranium that is used in commercial power plants, somewhere around 5% enrichment. So to get a kilogram of 4.5% or 5% enriched uranium, we're going to need about 8.9 or 9 kilograms of natural uranium coming in. <clears throat> That's simply because each kilogram of natural uranium doesn't have much uranium-235 in it. So to get up to this higher concentration, we have to have a bunch of kilograms to pull the uranium-235 out. So that uh, 8.9 kilograms is going to cost about $670. And then we have to pay for the work of doing the enrichment itself. And that is actually, interestingly, uh, kind of standardized into this measure called an SWU, or Separative Work Unit. And it turns out that these are kind of standard ways of looking at this, and there is a given amount of money assigned to this. Um, the current numbers I looked at said it was about $110. So that's $790 for the enrichment um, for a total of about $1,460 per kilogram. So that's how much you'd, been pay you'd be paying if you were building a commercial power plant reactor. Now, unfortunately, that's not enriched enough to do the rocket. And it's primarily a problem because commercial power plant reactors are very big and very heavy. And we need something that's much smaller and much lighter. So we need something that's more enriched. And that takes us to either high enriched uranium, which is 20% or more, or weapons grade uranium, which is 90% or more. And here are the entries for the table. So 20% takes you about 41 kilograms of natural. It's about $3,000, 43 SWUs which costs another $4,700 or 7,700 per kilogram total. And if you're going up to the weapons grade, which is what we need for this rocket, 92.5%, uh, 192 kilograms going in for 14,400, 222 separative work units for 24,400 with a final total dollar amount of $38,800 which seems like a lot, but for all the work you have to do it, uh, do to get to it, it doesn't seem that much. Uh, for sake of comparison, a kilogram of gold is about $56,000. So it's a little cheaper than that. So that's what we need. Uh, there are some reactor designs that only need 20. Uh, the one I chose actually needs 92.5. Uh, but there is a bit of a problem with these uraniums. Um, and they tend to be very hard to obtain for a specific reason. If you have 100 kilograms of 20% uranium, you will be able, to be able to make a nuclear device out of it. And if you have 15 kilograms of 90% uranium, you will also be able to make a nuclear device out of it. So to be able to get this, you need to look for a government sponsor, uh, someone who will work with you so you can get access to these higher enriched uraniums. Now, if you want to know more about enrichment and SWUs, I actually put a little uh, URL here, and this can tell you from a given enrichment level to another given enrichment level uh, how many SWUs it's going to take. Uh, it was actually kind of interesting. So, we have our uranium, now we need to make it into fuel rods. And this is a picture of the fuel rod geometry that we're going to be using in the engine. And you can see the fuel rod is hexagonal and the edges are about 1.1 uh, centimeters in length. Uh, they are 
as I said earlier, 132 centimeters long, so a little more than a uh, meter, 1.1 centimeters along the side. There are 19 longitudinal holes that are about a quarter of a centimeter that run the entire length of the fuel rod. You're probably saying, why do we need holes here? Well, the whole point of this reactor core is to heat up liquid hydrogen, vaporize it, and make it very hot. That's what we're going to use to drive the rocket. So these are the holes that the liquid hydrogen flows through. So it comes in one in the fuel rod, very cool, and then it comes, exits the other end, if everything's working, at somewhere around 2,700, maybe 3,000 degrees Kelvin. You will need 564 of these. Now, in between the fuel rods, we have what's called a tie tube. This is also hexagonal, and it's the same size as the fuel rod. Uh, the rods inside, in the circular portion, contain a zirconium hydride moderator sleeve, and this raises the reactivity. So by having that moderator sleeve in the middle, uh, we can get away with a smaller core and still have it work as a reactor. You'll need 241 of these. And then once you have the tie tubes and the fuel rods, you can put them together in this following pattern. And the tie tubes are metallic, at least on the outside, so they actually provide the structural support for the fuel rods, which are much more fragile. And if you look at the picture, you can see that all of the fuel rods have a tie rod next to them, uh, kind of locating their position. <clears throat> Once we have the fuel rods and the tie rods, we build them all up into this large circular arrangement, and that is what our reactor core is. So it's about 30 centimeters across, and it's 1.3 meters long. So a very long and thin design. Um, if you're interested, there's actually an alternate design for the SNRE Enhanced. And instead of the reactor rods being uh, 1.3 meters, they're closer to 89 centimeters, but the core is wider. So you kind of have your choice. You can either have a long, thin core, or you can have a shorter, wider core. Around the outside of the core here, we have these little circular things, and these are called control drums. And these are used to control the rate of the reaction. Um, if we turn them one direction, there is a material that enhances the reactivity. So we will get more of a chain reaction. And if we turn them the other way, there's a material that will uh, degrade the reaction. So the reaction goes down. So uh, at the top of the core, or you will need to have some sort of device that can rotate these appropriately to control the reaction. Now that shows you how the core is. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about how you will go about actually creating the fuel rods. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't any standard way to do this. If you are running a commercial power plant, there's a standard way to build fuel rods and you can just go to a supplier and essentially say, I need new fuel rods and they will fabricate them for you. Um, it will not be cheap, but uh, they will be able to, to, to do that. Um, unfortunately, nobody makes these kind of fuel rods that we need. So you're going to kind of be on your own. But there is this nice guide here that uh, tells you the vast majority of the details that you'll know about. So the fuel rods are actually composites. And they're made of a dry carbon mix, which is 85% graphite flour and 15% carbon black. In it, we have the uranium, and that shows up as small uranium oxide particles that have been coated in zirconium. And then finally, there is a thermosetting resin that is going to hold all of this together into something more solid.
Uh, the suggestion for enthusiasts is Varkum 8251 as a good choice. So because we need to create that 19 hole pattern, the fuel rods are extruded. And you can think of the extruded process as something very similar to the process that is used to make pasta, where you have a die and the pasta dough is extruded out and then cut off. You can think of doing the similar thing with the fuel rod. You need to extrude it out and once it gets to an appropriate length or probably a little longer than the appropriate length, um, you can cut it off and then deal with the curing and those sort of things later. It's also possible that you might want to create shorter fuel rods so that you can stack them vertically. I mean, uh, stack them in line to create the length that you need. It's another option that can be done. So once we've extruded them out, we have them in something to keep them in the proper shape and then they can be cured so that they are more solid. And then finally, we need to machine them to the final dimensions. If you remember the diagram of the core, you remember that uh, there aren't really big spaces between the fuel rods. We have the fuel rods and the uh, other rods connected in tight to each other. So all of the dimensions need to be very tight. So this means you're machining, you need to have the equipment to do the appropriate machining, and you need to remember that some of the things you are machining will be uranium containing. So you have to take proper precautions for that. And then finally, there's this problem with uh, carbon and hot hydrogen. So remember I said when the hydrogen goes through the through the holes, by the time it gets to the end of the fuel rod, it might be as hot as 3000 degrees Kelvin. And 3000 degree Kelvin hydrogen is pretty good at eroding uh, these fuel rods because of the carbon that's in them. So we need to have some way to fix that. So you are going to need to figure out a way to clad these fuel rods in a substance like zirconium carbide or equivalent, and that will prevent the hydrogen erosion. And note that not only on the out, you need to do that not only the, on the outside of the fuel rods, but through each of the holes. That's one of the reasons why it might be easier to do these fuel rods in short sections rather than uh, long uh, full length sections. So that's all about fuel rods. So now we have enough information that we can make the reactor core and we know how to control it. Now we need to go on and actually build the engine, rocket engine part that goes around the core. And I'm going to start by talking about a non-nuclear chemical rocket uh, because this is a useful analog for what we are going to build. And this is an engine using what's called the expander cycle. And this is how it works. Uh, we have a liquid oxygen tank and a liquid hydrogen tank. We have a turbo pump that has two pumps and one turbine. And then finally, we have a combustion chamber with a cooling jacket around it. So we want to start the engine up. We open up our liquid hydrogen pipe and it has a little pressure. So uh, it'll go through the turbo pump, turbo pump, not very fast because there isn't much pressure, and flow into this cooling jacket. And it'll flow out and through the turbo pump turbine. Now, as I said, there isn't much pressure, so it's not gonna, it may make it spin, but it won't make it spin very quickly. And then the outlet from that will go into the combustion chamber. Similar, similarly, the liquid oxygen comes into the turbine, I mean into the pump, and is also pumped into the combustion, the combustion chamber. So now we have both of the propellants in there, and we can ignite them, and the rocket will start to burn. As it ignites, and as those propellants burn, it will heat up the combustion chamber and the nozzle, 
and that will cause the hydrogen that we're pumping through it to heat up and become less dense and increase its pressure. So we will now use that pressure to drive the turbo pump. And that will cause the turbo pump to spin. That will therefore pump more liquid oxygen and more liquid hydrogen into the combustion chamber, producing more combustion and more heat. And eventually we will reach the state where our rocket engine is up and running and we end up with thrust. So that's the expander cycle. How do we apply this to a nuclear thermal engine? Well, the first thing to know is we actually don't use any liquid oxygen. So we can just get rid of that. And then the process is the same. Liquid hydrogen goes through into the cooling channel, goes back into the turbo pump and into the combustion chamber. But we don't have liquid oxygen to burn it with. What we have is the nuclear reactor that is going to heat things up. So it heats up the hydrogen coming in and that heats up the combustion chamber and the nozzle and then that once again drives the turbo pump and that's how we uh, pump the fuel in. So the nuclear thermal engine approach just like the chemical expander approach but without the liquid oxygen part. And that finally gives us thrust. So one of the problems we're going to have to deal with is the problem called shielding. And this is a design called NERVA, which was a popular one amongst early enthusiasts. And you can see it really has all the parts that we've been talking about. It has a reactor core, it has control drums, it has the nozzle, it has all the propellant lines. I want to call your attention to a couple things. Um, the first is this internal shield, which sits just kind of on top of the reactor core. And the reason we have this internal shield is that rea the reactor core is operating as a reactor. And because of that, it's generating a lot of radiation. And we actually need to protect the rest of the motor, the parts on top, um, from that radiation. So we have a shield that's actually inside of the rocket motor. And that's kind of the first level shield. In addition, a little farther away, we have this external disc shield. And why do we have that? Well, here's a little graphic that shows us why. And you can see the engine all the way on the left, and you can see that kind of grayish circular disc shield. And because the reactor is creating a lot of radiation, we need a way to keep that away from the rest of the craft. Um, especially far on the right, we either have a cargo part or we have a habitat. And to protect everything else, it always needs to be in the shadow of our shielding. So there are kind of two other things we have to remember. Um, the first thing is that the reactor area even though the reaction, uh, when the reaction is going on, it puts out a lot of radioactivity. When we shut it off, it still puts out a fair bit of radioactivity. So even after the engine has finished operating, we still need to stay in this shadow. Um, the other thing to know when you're building this is that shielding is heavy. So that's one of the reasons why nuclear thermal rocket engines are heavy. The core is kind of heavy and you need to add in shielding. So let's say we're at the point where we've created our core, we've created the engine, we're all ready, we think we have something good. Now it's time for testing it. And in the early days of nuclear rockets, the way you do this is you'd find uh, some place out in the desert, maybe in the Nevada desert, and you'd build yourself a test site. And you'd take your engine, you'd mount it on a rail car, and that would be done either in the EMAD or the RMAD sections here. And then you would send it out to a site and you'd hook it up to some containers of liquid hydrogen and you would fire it. 
and the rocket exhaust would just go up into the air. Now, when you're finished firing it, as I said before, your rocket is going to be pretty radioactive. So you're going to take the engine on the rail car and move it somewhere else for a little while so that the radioactivity can decay down and it's easier to work with. And then you're going to move it into what is called a hot box. And a hot box is merely any construction um, that has enough shielding that you can operate on uh, things like rockets that have already run. Anything with a nuclear core you can take into the hot box and then you can have people outside the hot box and there's enough shielding that it is not problematic. Here's an example of the kind of thing you will need. So you'll notice it's a big room in the middle, kind of on a turntable it looks like. We have what looks like a rocket core and then there are these two large manipulator arms, one coming from the wall and then one coming from a crane up above. And by using those two, the rocket engine can be disassembled and we can take out the core and inspect it. And you're probably asking yourself, okay, so we've just built this thing, we fired it, why do we have to take it apart to inspect it? And remember the part I talked to you about nitrogen, I mean, uh, hydrogen erosion, the only way to know if that's happening is to fire the rocket and uh, take it apart and look at it. And you can also see, for example, whether or not any of your fuel rods melted, which might happen if your temperature was too hot. Now this is kind of a publicity shot here of the hot box. Um, as you can see, there are two people standing inside of it. And I can tell you uh, very surely that if that was an actual radioactive core, there would not be two people standing that close next to it. Uh, that would not be very good. So that's how we tested in the old days. Um, in the current days, there have been some approaches that make things a little easier. Um, if you are lucky, you can find a fellow, a fellow enthusiast who has built what's called an in-trees tester. And this is uh, a big device, and it lets you look at the non-nuclear performance of fuel assemblies and configurations. So remember, I was talking about the hydrogen erosion problem. And the hydrogen erosion problem isn't because of anything to do with it being a nuclear reactor. It's because you have lots of very hot hydrogen. So an entries tester can heat hydrogen to the temperature you need and then you can run it through the fuel rod and you can test and then run it through the fuel rod and then pull the fuel rod out and you can actually inspect it and see if it is behaving the way you want it to or whether you're seeing erosion and the nice part you can do the nice part about this is you can do it without turning it into a nuclear reactor so after coming out of this tester it's just as radioactive as it was when it went in. So that can be a huge advantage of testing. However, you're probably still going to need to do some actual testing. And here's what's currently recommended by enthusiasts. You go back out, probably to the same sort of place you would have done that other sort of testing, and you dig a hole in the ground. Um, it's about 8 feet across, and it's about 1,200 feet deep. And then you mount your rocket on top of that and you have uh, essentially a ring of water spray that can point in and kind of push water down into the hole. And then you run the rocket. And uh, the water will cool down the rocket exhaust and that's very good. And if there are any radioactive isotopes that come off, um, so you have erosion and you're eroding your fuel rod that has uranium in it and it has other stuff in it. Um, those will merely end up at the bottom of the hole. And similarly, if you happen to melt anything in your core or your core falls apart for some reason, those parts will also end up at the bottom of the hole. And that's good from a protection perspective.
Now you're still going to have the problem that your rocket engine is going to become very radioactive uh, while you're doing this test fire. So you're still going to need the sort of hot box that they used in the past. That's all there. So that is what you need to do to create the nuclear engine. And now to finish the tug design, we need to have something to mount the nuclear engine to. And since we spent a lot of effort kind of building that engine from scratch, um, it can be nice for us to use something off the shelf to do the tug design. And I decided for the purposes of the engine we were building, it was interesting to use a Centaur upper stage. And the Centaur upper stage has been used for well over 40 years. Um, it's very well understood. So it's uh, good that it's well understood and you could actually go out and buy a Centaur stage if you wanted to. Um, and then we're going to put two different engines on it. We're going to put the RL-10 engine, which is the stock engine that a Centaur would normally use, uses liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And then we're going to put in the enhanced SNRE nuclear thermal engine we built. And one of the reasons I chose that engine is it has about the same amount of thrust as the RL-10. So it's very useful for making comparisons. And then we're going to compare the two and see what results we get with the two different engines. So, uh, starting out with the RL-10, the Centaur holds a little over 20,000 kilograms of propellant. It is distributed this way. There is a small liquid oxygen tank that holds about 17,000 kilograms and a much larger liquid hydrogen tank which only shows, only holds 3,000 kilograms. And that might look a little curious. Um, what you need to know is that liquid oxygen is about 16 times more dense than liquid hydrogen. So you can put a lot of liquid oxygen in a small space compared to uh, how much liquid hydrogen you could put in it. Now, if we're gonna convert this over to a nuclear thermal rocket, we don't really need the liquid oxygen. So essentially what we're gonna do is just fill that space with more liquid hydrogen. And that ends up with this sort of configuration. So we have about 4,100 kilograms of liquid hydrogen in that space. Now I need to go a little bit into the rocket equation because we need to use it to do the comparison. Um, if you want to know the details, you can go look at my other video on solar system road trips and it will tell you a lot more about the rocket equation and a lot more about what the resulting delta V values mean. But for the sake of this discussion, there are two points that I think are interesting. Uh, the first part of the equation is the specific impulse or ISP. And that's typically thought of as kind of a fuel efficiency uh, measure. And as we said early, the reactor design for the SNRE Enhanced gives an ISP of around 900, a little more than that. Okay, so that's good. That's considerably more than we would get from a chemical rocket. So in general, the reason why nuclear thermal rockets are interesting is they have a superior ISP. And that should give us more delta V if your ISP is higher. However, if we look at this other factor, uh, things are a little different. And the two masses here, you can think of mass empty as how much your rocket weighs with just the rocket structure and the payload, but no propellant. And then M total is that same weight plus the propellant. So we figure out that ratio, we take the natural log, and that's the other factor here. And it turns out that NTRs have inferior mass fractions here. You remember how I said that the rocket was heavy because we needed shielding and because the core is heavy? That is one of the things that drives down this mass fraction. 
So we have these two factors, one that should improve ISP, one that will probably reduce ISP. Who wins? Well, let's look at an example. So we're going to go back to uh, the two Centaur examples, and I'm going to kind of arbitrarily choose uh, M empty to be 1,946 kilograms, which is what Centaur weighs without the engine. That's an approximate weight. Uh, plus the engine, plus an 8,000 kilogram payload. And that's somewhat arbitrary, but that's kind of in the right class of what you'd be wanting to move around. So that's what I chose. Um, just to put the ISPs up here, the ISP for the RL10 is 465, and the ISP for the SNRE is about 900. So you can see the SNRE is uh, almost twice the ISP. But if we look at the factor, the natural log M total of M over M empty, we will see that for the RL10, it's about 1.1. And for the SNRE, it's 0 0.27. So let's plug both of those into the delta V equation. And what do we get? A little over 5,000 for the RL10. And only 2,380 for the SNRE. And that doesn't look very good for this engine we just built. But I really think this isn't exactly a fair comparison. So let's look at this a slightly different way. Rather than saying, if we have this, uh, what delta V can we get for that, propellant, for that given payload? Let's flip this around. And let's say we have a mission where we need a delta V of 4,000 meters per second. Let's ask each version how much payload it can create or how much payload it can move to a place that is 4,000 meters per second away in delta V. So here we have our two centaurs. Start out with the RL10 and its payload is 12,600 kilograms. And I'm also gonna put, uh, and for the SNRE, the payload it can take to 4,000 meters per second is only 2,070 kilograms. Okay, that doesn't look very promising. But if we look at the total mass, we'll see something kind of interesting. So 12,600 kilograms uh, plus the propellant mass, and we end up with the total mass of 35,600. But if we want to look at that for the nuclear example, it's only 11,400 kilograms. So what we see is that our final version with the nuclear rocket is much, much lighter than the final version for the RL-10. And that's primarily because the liquid hydrogen is so much lighter than the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen used by the RL-10. So is there a way we can make this comparison better? And I thought about it and I came up with one. All we need to do is expand the Centaur tank so that it has enough propellant in it to get a similar payload as the RL10 version. So uh, in doing that, we went from a centaur that was 12.7 meters to one that is 28.8 meters. Um, that's getting kind of long, so we might want to make it bigger around, but uh, we could probably do this, probably get it to work. And if we do that, we can get a payload of 12,700 kilograms, and we can get a total mass of 34,200 kilograms. So what do we see? Well, we actually see for these two engines and these two uh, optimized vehicles for the engines, that it's pretty much a wash. Uh, both of them can give us a uh, payload somewhere around 12,000 kilograms, and both of them will weigh somewhere around 35,000 kilograms in total. So what's the summary? Well, 
The summary is that the high ESP of that nuclear thermal engine we built looks great. An ISP almost double of what we would get with another engine. But there are obviously some issues. Um, the first problem is the engine is inherently heavy. We have a heavy core, we have to have a heavy structure around it, and we have to have heavy shielding. So that's problematic. The other problem is to hold the amount of liquid hydrogen we need, we need a big set of tanks. And those tanks are inherently heavier than the ones for a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen uh, solution. In this case, they're about three times bigger, so they're quite a bit heavier. Uh, the difference between the, the nuclear thermal reactor and nu nuclear thermal rocket and the chemical solutions are really not significant, at least in this scenario. And finally, nuclear thermal engines have a few disadvantages. Um, you have to figure out how you're going to get access to those nuclear materials. Um, there's no off-the-shelf engine solution. So I can go buy that Centaur today with an RL-10 engine on it. Probably take them a few months to make it, but I don't have to do any extra work. And as you saw, constructing the nuclear thermal rocket is a lot of work. That's going to take you some time to do. And testing is, of course, a little problematic and therefore a little expensive. So that's the summary for this scenario, but it's really not the end of the discussion. And it turns out that one of the big enthusiastic groups around nuclear thermal rockets has done some uh, modeling or some planning around using nuclear thermal rockets to visit Mars and how you do that with nuclear thermal rockets and how you would do that with chemical rockets. And they have a nice long discussion of that, and I think it's a really interesting topic. But that topic de deserves a separate video. So I'll be covering it that at some time in the future. So that's all I wanted to talk about. Thanks for your attention.